Hey everybody, it's Mark Pattison back again with another awesome episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And this week, I've got a great dude who I happened to meet on the slopes of Vincent Massif down in Antarctica about three months ago. And uh, his name is Garrett Madison, and he's been in the guide business now for a long time, I think over 20 years. And uh, had an awesome time just really catching up with him. And uh, he started his own mountaineering guide service. And uh, anyways, very fascinating. He, he's seen it all and wanted to bring him on the pod and, and just talk about his adventures. And as we speak, he's about ready to launch for Everest to have his probably 13, 14 time up there. So I uh, look forward to getting into that. So on that note, Garrett, how you doing? Hey, Mark, I'm doing great, thanks. I uh, really enjoy being on the call with you today. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, look, at, let's, uh, let's reset a few things. So I think we became uh, uh, Facebook friends uh, through the, the power of the internet a while ago, and then uh, as just uh, fate would have it, uh, you were guiding a guy, I think it was a solo climber, up, uh, uh, up the face of uh, Vincent Massif, and I mean, you might have been coming up or coming down, but we, we, we traded... Uh, uh, pleasant trees, and then from there we uh, connected later uh, uh, down at Glacier Union and uh, had a nice chat and 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 uh, kind of explored some of the things that you were doing, and it was pretty cool. But but how long now? Just let's just put the facts on the table. How long have you you been in the guide business? My my records show that it's been since 1999. That's correct. Yeah, in the summer of '99. I got my first job as an apprentice mountain guide on Mount Rainier with with RMI, Rainier Mountaineering Incorporated, which was yeah. the, the only big guide company at the time on Mount Rainier. And so it's, it's coming up on 20 years this summer. Yeah, that's awesome. A guy who I've had on the pod earlier, I mean, this is, I'm on now podcast almost 100, um, you'll be marking. And I go back to probably like podcast 42 and had Lou Whitaker, who is the founder of RMI, again, Rainier Mountaineering Incorporated. And uh, like, just like uh, Rainier, RMI, IMG, many of these other ones, there have been so many companies that have really uh, blossomed and been born on the on the face of Mount Rainier, uh, located just out of Seattle. Absolutely, yeah. What, what the Whitakers created uh, starting back in the 60s on Mount Rainier, um, the guide service Rainier Mountaineering, really has uh, spawned a lot of other guides and guide service companies um, off of that initial organization that have gone on to climb all over the world. So it, it's really an incredible network or uh, breeding ground of, of climbers for big mountains. Yeah. So for you growing up on Bainbridge Island, which is this, for people who don't know, it's a, it's a pretty cool island, about 30-ish type minutes by ferry, um, just right off uh, the Seattle coastline. And uh, growing up there, what was your attraction to the mountains, the outdoors? I mean, what was that draw for you? Gosh, you know, I was more of a team sports guy growing up in school, uh, played football, basketball, lacrosse. Um, but it was in the summertime that my dad and I went out to go on hikes and backpacking trips in the mountains around Seattle. There's the Olympic Mountains to the west on the Olympic Peninsula and the Cascade Mountains to the east of Seattle. And uh, my father was, was really excited to get out in the summer and go on these hiking trips. So we would uh, make a plan to hike up to a high mountain lake somewhere in the mountains, get all of our gear laid out, packed, ready to go, and then go off for about a week and uh, explore and often get into the backcountry. And uh, generally, we'd get up to these high mountain lakes and camp out for a few days and fish for trout, but I always wanted to scramble up to the high ridge, ridge lines and, and neighboring peaks and get the, um, the amazing views, the 360-degree view from the summit. And so that's kind of what got me into the outdoors initially and into the mountains. Yeah, that's great. You know, my dad really had a big impact on me as well. Um, uh, my parents were both teachers. And uh, so, you know, middle income uh, type family and, and many of the friends I had, you know, their, 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 their fathers uh, were doctors, lawyers, those types of things. And so while they were jetting off to, to Hawaii and other exotic places, uh, I would go in our little VW bug um, up to the Cascades, which are the local mountains just outside of, of, of Seattle, and then over to Chelan which is a lake about three hours away, big, big lake, and uh, be in the outdoors and camp. And, and that was really my first exposure to the things that I do today uh, in the mountains. But, you know, I think we all need mentors and, and people that give us inspiration. And, and certainly your dad 
I did that for you. And now you're paying it forward in terms of um, breaking out and, and, and doing your own thing. So let's talk about that for a minute. So, so you, you start off uh, at learning and, and kind of cutting your teeth, so to speak, on, the, uh, on Mount Rainier. For those who don't know, it's just outside of Seattle, about three hours. It towers uh, really over the state, 14,500-ish. And uh, how many times have you been on top of that mountain? Gosh, it's coming up closer to 200 summits at this point. Um, we, we try to keep track. And, uh, you know, out of those uh, summits, there's a number of attempts also where we didn't summit. So definitely attempted the peak over 200 times and, and coming in close here on 200 summits. Hopefully I'll get that this summer or next summer. Well, I'd love to climb with you. I, I've done it uh, a few times. I've been up to uh, Camp Mir, um, going from 5,000 feet at Paradise up to, to Camp Mir again. Uh, nice, you know, uh, poke. Uh, going up the snow fields, fairly steep. And uh, I've, I've seen it all. I've seen a lot of people make it up there easily. I've been up there uh, with Ed Veasters and others. And uh, I've also seen people uh, that I've been with that I try to guide up there <laughs> get horribly sick around 8,000 feet. So body chemistry has such a big component on, on, uh, on how it plays. You may look the, 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 the role, the, you know, kind of fit what a mountaineer should look like. But at the end of the day, if you're not breathing, if you don't have the right uh, hydration, the foods, everything else, I mean, you can go to, you know, hell in a handbag, so to speak, in a minute. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of that. Yeah, absolutely. Rainier is just a fantastic mountain to climb, a great training ground for bigger peaks. And um, and it's been my experience going up there on nice days where you, where you get a stellar view of uh, the Puget Sound and the surrounding mountains and it, it can seem kind of casual sometimes but other days when there's a maritime storm coming off the pacific that slams into the mountain and uh, you're in a white out with 50 mile an hour winds and all of a sudden your clothing and gear is covered in a quarter inch of ice rime ice we call it uh, things can change pretty quickly and it can get pretty real um, and that's great training for for being on bigger mountains some of these high altitude peaks all over the world yeah, we're going to get into into this. So for the listener, we're going to we're going to talk about here in a few minutes about uh, your treks going up to uh, Mount Everest. You've been up there several times, and also K two, one of the most dangerous mountains in the world. Um, but but before we get there, let's talk about the kind of the chronological order. So you you were on uh, Mount Rainier training with RMI, and then ultimately you ended up with a a another. Uh, uh, guide service uh called alpine ascents actually alpine ascents was the company as you know that i was with on vincent massif when i was up there uh in january 2019 so how, how what was that progression for you to go from uh rmi into alpine ascents and ultimately uh starting your own gig sure well the the chronological uh progression uh started out in high school when uh, my dad and i decided we wanted to take on the challenge of climbing Mount Rainier. And neither of us had the technical experience or the know-how to feel like we could climb the glaciated peak the size of Rainier safely. So we decided to go with the guide service, Rainier Mountaineering, and uh, did all of our training, bought the gear, uh, showed up, met our guides there in mid-June. And uh, we were climbing with a guy by the name of Phil Urschler, who's just an yeah. iconic mountain guide. He's, he's a real guide guy. Yeah. And, uh, I know so Phil. An incredible I, know, I, experience. I know Phil and Sue very well. They're great people. Yeah. So uh, we met Phil Urschler, and I thought, wow, this is what it takes to be a mountaineer. Um, and we did the training. We hiked up to Camp Muir. We slept there for a few hours. We left at about midnight, climbed to the summit. Um, and it was just amazing sharing the rope with my dad and, and some other friends and the guides. And it was hard work for us. Uh, I wouldn't say it was easy. Um, we got to the summit and I thought, what an amazing experience to share with people that you're close with in life. And we got down and I thought, gosh, this is just incredible. The whole experience, the, the goal setting, the challenge, the preparation, training, um, the execution, climbing up to the summit, feeling some real exposure. So speak grasses, you know, it's real. Um, you're roped together so you can help each other if somebody falls down. Um, and then coming down, just knowing that we had this memory to share for the rest of our lives. It really hooked me in, and I thought, gosh, I want to do more of this. So I started doing more climbing in the summers in Washington State, other volcanoes like Mount Baker, Mount Adams, um, in the Olympics. And when I got into college, um, after my first summer, I thought, 
gosh, how am I going to spend more time up there in the mountains and on Mount Rainier? I decided getting the job as a mountain guide would be the way to go. So in 1999, I went to the guide tryouts uh, for RMI on Mount Rainier in April, and there were about 100 of us who had made it through the selection process with our applications uh, to get invited to the guide tryouts. And so we met up at Paradise, uh, 5,400 feet there on Mount Rainier, and uh, met the Whitakers, uh, Peter, his dad, Lou, uh, a bunch of the RMI senior guides. And then we went on to the tryout training. They wanted to see who we were, you know, both uh, what kind of technical climbers we were and, and fitness levels, but also what kind of people we are. Because uh, obviously there's a lot of teaching that goes into guiding and uh, you're going to spend a lot of time with these people over the course of your guiding on Mount Rainier. So I was lucky enough to get hired that summer and uh, started off as an apprentice guide on Mount Rainier and worked there for eight summer seasons um, while I finished college. And then also um, after college, I was living in the French Alps for a bit. And I worked for other guide companies uh, along the way as well in the um, off season, the autumn, the winter, and the spring, guiding in uh, South America, um, sometimes in the Himalaya. And uh, it was in 2007, early 2007, that Mount Rainier National Park decided to break up the monopoly that RMI had, and they redistributed it so that RMI then had half of all the guiding business, about 3,200 clients and guides per summer. And two other companies, which we each have a quarter of the guiding business. Um, the companies that won those bids were IMG, International Mountains Guides, and AAI, Alpine Ascent International. And so they each would be taking about 800 clients and guides per summer at Mount Rainier. And I had met with Alpine Ascent, and uh, it seemed like the, the owner there and the, the general manager liked me. And they said, hey, why don't you come work for us and be our guide manager and help manage this Mount Rainier program. So I started in early 2007 and worked for Alpine Ascent International, initially on Mount Rainier, helping uh, hire guides, train guides, and I led about 20 Rainier trips that summer. And then I went to take over the Aconcagua program for Alpine Ascent down in Argentina, yep. and then also moved into the Vincent program and uh, started going to Everest that next season uh, after 2009 with Alpine Ascent every year. Um, and it was just a great experience working for Alpine Ascent, a great job. I still have many good friends there at the company. Um, and it gave me a lot of crucial experience um, organizing and leading expedition climbs all over the world, Seven Summits and beyond. And um, it wasn't until uh, early 2014 that I decided to break out on my own and start my own company, Madison Mountaineering. Yeah, no, there, there's a lot in there. And I want to I want to back that up just a little bit. So uh, congratulations to you for having the entrepreneurial spirit to recognize that you have value and that a lot of people uh, want to climb with you. And, and, you know, after a while, you start to understand the, the whole supply chain. And many of these different countries uh, that you that 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 you've guided in that I've climbed in, uh, use local uh, whether you want to call it porters or Sherpas or or the uh, the mules and all those types of things and on Aconcagua, you get to know those people. And after a while, I'm sure you're saying, well, look, I could do this too. And, and you did. And now you have this very successful company in Madison Mountaineering, which is a cool name. And you guys are doing a lot of cool stuff. One of the things that I have a big problem with uh, is this, is that uh, I'm not at that level where I'm you know, like doing stuff like Ed Veasters and Jimmy Chin, where you just pick a couple of your bros, you guys know exactly what they're doing. Um, and I have this a lot when I played in the NFL in, in college at the University of Washington, where the cream uh, just rises to the top. And so you're playing with a lot of really elite players and you don't really have that many weak links. It kind of weeds itself out. In the mountaineering business, it's a little bit different. And so what that means is this, is that when I want to go and climb these, these crazy mountains, which I've done and which are the mountains that you guide on, uh, the Seven Summits, uh, Kilimanjaro and Mount El Elbrus in Russia and uh, Carson's Pyramid, um, Aconcagua, Denali, you know, the, all these other ones. Um, I train my butt off and I put myself in a great position to be as physically, mentally, emotionally ready to go and attack that mountain and take on whatever I need to take on and go at a pretty healthy pace. And every single time, every single trip I've been on, there's always some dude who thinks that 
they've read a book, they've seen a movie, and they want to be this certain person. And at the end of the day, they, they are just not. And so you run into kind of problems, they run into, you know, falling crevasses, they get cold, there's frostbite, you get the whole thing. It just happened to us when we were in Vincent, on Vincent. And um, it's frustrating to me because, you know, I, I can only go as fast as, again, that weakest link. And when you're doing that, and you have people that put you in jeopardy, it's just very frustrating from my standpoint, because it's just like, you know, why did I train so hard? Uh, I'm sure you've seen that a lot more than I, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how you deal with that. Sure. Well, that's a great point. And I, I remember vividly when uh, we crossed paths down there on Mount Vincent in Antarctica this past season, um, I saw your, your group, your rope team, about 12 or 15 climbers in total. And, and I saw you at the front of one of those rope teams and I thought, Who's that guy? I don't recognize that guide. And then it wasn't later until I got to know you and realized, oh, well, you, you, weren't, you weren't one of the guides, but you were assuming a guide's role by leading a rope team. And you just looked like a guide because you trained hard and did all of your, uh, your preparation and, and practice and mentally, physically, like you were ready for anything to, to lead that rope team to take on the mountain. So uh, I, I definitely hear what you're saying. Um, it is challenging when you sign up for a group where you don't know everybody and you're not sure what everybody's skill level is or, or level of preparation and training. Um, and that's an issue with, with these group climbs. Really, the only way to ensure that everyone's going to be at the same level is, is to go with people that you know really well and have done a lot of climbing with. So it is challenging. Um, I guess I, I do a mix of things. I do the group trips, but I also do private trips, which uh, are more expensive because it's just one-on-one, -on -one, two people. But um, that's where someone has the opportunity to just kind of go at their own pace the entire time. Um, in terms of the group trips, like on Everest, what I do, uh, which is very different than many guide companies, I let everybody go their own pace. So rather than setting a pace that everybody has to adhere to and march in a line up the mountain and back down, I like to spread out. And so I have one guide go in the front, one go in the back, and everyone can walk their own pace. So if you want to go fast, if you're aggressive, uh, motor up there to camp one and beyond that's totally fine go at your own pace if you want to walk slow you can do that and then we've got other guides and sherpas floating and i feel like that's the most efficient and the most reasonable way to accommodate everybody in these group climbs well i absolutely lo love that and uh, by the way so for everybody listening and by the time we run this pod you will you know squarely be up and into the game of mount everest normally it's about a two month at least process um, acclimating, uh, climbing up uh, uh, to Everest Base Camp and then going up and down and up and down and, and getting everybody prepared ultimately to have that window between probably May 15th and the end of May uh, where the sky is open, the jet stream uh, goes away, so to speak, a little bit, and you have an opportunity to, to take the top uh, of Everest. So uh, you are leaving uh, today, I believe, for the mountain uh, and and a pretty impressive. Now, you've been up on top of Everest how many times? 12? Uh, nine summits over 11 attempts. There were two years there where we didn't summit, 2014, 2015, where everyone on the south side had to cancel due to some natural disasters and tragedies. But every other year, I've been very lucky and fortunate to make it to the summit. So hopefully this spring will be my 10th summit of Everest. Yeah, that's incredible. And, and what that makes them even more uh, incredible, and this is just kind of starting to at least – from my standpoint, um, hearing more and more about it, you've got this kind of combo uh, where you've now done it three times, uh, and that is to go and take the top of Mount Rainier. You come down to, I think, uh, Camp 4, and then there's a way that you can hit uh, and go up the, the world's fourth tallest peak, Lhotse, and take the top there. So you get kind of a two-for-one without having to go all the way back down. You've now done that three times, the only American uh, to have done that, that feat. And uh, are you going to be doing and attempting that again this year with this group or what, what's in store for you? Yeah, that's my plan. Um, out of our 12 climbers signed up on, on the team this year, um, three of them want to also attempt Mount Lhotse, the fourth highest peak after Everest. So I hope that uh, everything lines up like it did last year and we can do that combination peak to peak climb from the summit of Everest over to the summit of Lhotse. Um, and get down safe so obviously it's condition dependent um, and we, we have to have good weather but uh, I think it's it's within reason um, and, I, and this goes back to my uh, first climb of Everest in 2006 I remember uh, coming down from the summit and looking over 
at Mount Lotsey there across the saddle, fourth highest peak. And I thought, wow, that's not too far away. That, that would actually be doable if you had planned and prepared everything to do it. Meaning you trained for it, you had equipment in place, uh, your, your oxygen, your food, your ropes, um, and really strategized for it. So it wasn't until 20, 2011 um, that I was with Alpine Ascents and I, and I proposed to the owner of the company, Todd Brosson, hey, we should offer this option to our climbers if they want to try climbing Lhotse after Everest. And so we had a few guys sign up for that option and, and I did it with one of the climbers that year. And that was really cool. I, I think of it as a bonus climb, um, climbing Lhotse the next day and looking back onto Mount Everest and the route you climbed the day previous to the top of the world. And um, it's just a really cool route up Lhotse, really steep and narrow. And generally, there aren't many people attempting Lhotse. So you get the whole thing to yourself. Um, and it's just a beautiful summit to hang out on and look back at Everest and look over into China and back into Nepal. So uh, fingers crossed that it'll work out again this time. I'll get my fourth uh, combination climb of Everest and Lhotse in. That's amazing. So, so how fried are you when you come off? I mean, you know, the whole thing, I mean, you've talked about now, uh, you, you've been on the top of Everest now nine times. You're hoping to have it, uh, take it for your 10th. Uh, and you, you make it up, you come back down, you've got your mind, your mental, uh, really mindset around what you need to do to get on the top. So it's not this gigantic wave that you're trying to tackle and take on. You, you do that and you come back down and now not only you, but you're taking others. Uh, how fried are you? Now that you're at, at camp four and now you get some, I don't know how many, four or five hours of rest and then you're taking on a whole new mountain. Exactly. Um, it does require a, a certain level of fitness and endurance, but it also requires motivation and just mental toughness and mental commitment. And the older I get, I'm 40 now, um, the more I realize that the mental part of the game is, is the biggest factor, the most important. I think it's 90% mental, 10% physical up there on Everest, uh, assuming you've done your, your preparation and training. Um, we get back to high camp. We've just been up on the Everest summit. You know, sometimes things go sideways if there's other teams that uh, need assistance or if the weather changes and, and the winds pick up. Um, but by the time we get back to high camp, we've been climbing for probably 16 hours uh, or longer that day. And we're pretty tired. But by being able to rest up there and have adequate supplies and resources like oxygen, uh, fuel, stoves to, to melt water, um, to cook some, some dehydrated meal, get a little rest, we're pretty well uh, recovered, or at least somewhat recovered, by that evening to then head out again at midnight and uh, head over to Lhotse and climb the fourth highest mountain in the world. And, you know, it's always tough just to get going, to get out of bed in the middle of the night when it's cold and dark and windy and everybody else is sleeping. And uh, me and the Lhotse guys have just climbed Everest with everyone the day before. And now we're getting up again at midnight to go off and, and climb Lhotse. Um, it takes a little bit of motivation to make it happen. But once we get going, get out of camp and start climbing up the route, uh, we just get totally stoked. You know, it's like that feeling of, of being in the game when, when you're going for it and you see the prize out there, the ultimate goal that lays ahead and that you just, you're in your, you're in your movement at that point and making it happen. And, and that's when we get really excited. Yeah. I think everything you're talking about uh, can really be applied to so many different things. Uh, you know, whether you're, you're playing in the NFL or college football sports, you're in business, you're climbing these mountains, whatever you're trying to do, it's all about mindset. I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer. And I also believe that part of that, is that you have to put yourself in tough physical positions prior to that event and what you're about to take on to become mentally tough and to have that kind of mindset. I don't believe you can do it the other way around. I don't think that you can you know, wake up and every morning you're, you're focused on trying to be really mentally tough, but you haven't done any, any of the physical part. I think it works the other way around for me, and that's just been my experience. But uh, certainly it's going to be exciting for you to go up there and hopefully, you know, knock on wood, the weather cooperates and you're able to pull that off with you, your, not only yourself, but your team. So let's transition over 2015. You're on Everest, you're coming down and uh, from the top and, and all of a sudden, well, actually, I don't even think you made it to the top. You were coming down from a higher camp and all of a sudden the, this, you know, gigantic once in a hundred year uh, uh, event happens with the avalanche and just wipes out everything. Uh, what was that like for you? So 
April uh, 25th, 2015, I believe, was the Nepal earthquake. And uh, let me back up a little bit because the year before, 2014, um, I was on Mount Everest. I just started my own company. I had my very first project um, leading an expedition team on Everest. Uh, it was going to be uh, in conjunction with the Discovery Channel. There was going to be live filming, uh, broadcast uh, around the world. And we had this really ambitious, fun project planned. And um, before we even got up to Camp One, we, we were in base camp, we were all set up. Before we even got up to Camp One on uh, April 18th, a big chunk of ice broke off on the west shoulder of Mount Everest and came crashing down into the Kumbu Icefall route between base camp and Camp One and killed 16 climbing Sherpas, three of which were working for my team, uh, another five that I knew and had worked with on other trips. Um, and so I spent that day, April 18, the next day, April 19, up in the ice fall, trying to dig these guys out and, and recover their bodies. Um, it was just a horrible tragedy. And obviously after that, um, we canceled our expedition and all teams canceled their expeditions on the Nepal side of Everest that year. Um, so nobody summited, I, I believe, on the south side. Um, there's a rumor that a Chinese woman summited after a helicopter and up to Camp 2 later in the season, but I can't confirm that. Mm -hmm. um, so the next year, 2015, we come back and um, we're excited to make it safer. So we found a route from base camp to camp one that avoided that left side of the Kumbu Icefall route that was under the hanging ice from the west shoulder of Everest. And we thought, okay, by staying in the center of the icefall, we're away from that objective hazard, that danger of an ice avalanche coming down and, and burying the route. So we felt really good about that and uh, things were really coming together and going well and, and people were very positive in light of the, the previous year's tragedy. And we were up at camp two on April 25th, 2015, when the Nepal earthquake occurred. And I think it killed approximately 9,000 people in Nepal, mm. if I'm not mistaken, uh, about 22 at Everest Base Camp. Now, what happened was we were up there at Camp 2 on the, on the Western Coon Glacier, and all of a sudden it felt like we were on a trampoline bouncing up and down. And uh, we realized it's an earthquake. And I thought, oh, no, there's going to be some big chunks of ice that break off from these mountaintop ridgelines around us and come crashing down. And so I yelled at my team to pull up our bucks, which is the, uh, the neck scarf we wear that can um, block your airway from any snow blowing in. And, uh, Earthquake settled down, and, and we were okay. A few in our team got knocked over by some wind blasts that came down uh, after the avalanches, but everyone was okay. And then we got on the radio to talk to base camp, and I was thinking, you know, they were going to be worried about us because we're up higher on the mountain where it's riskier, more dangerous, you're further away from help. Um, and we couldn't get in touch with base camp. And eventually we got through, and we learned that a massive chunk of ice had broken off a mountain just uh, behind base camp and come crashing down and generated a wind blast that ripped through base camp, probably 200 plus mile an hour winds and literally blew out the whole central part of base camp. Um, giant boulders were flying through the air, tents were blown uh, a couple hundred feet. And unfortunately, 22 people, I believe, were killed that day in base camp, one of which was uh, a person very close to me, our base camp here. Um, so it was a, a really tough situation to learn about that and then to get down because we're up there at camp two, the whole route from base camp to camp one through the Kumbu Icefall, which is a series of ropes and ladders, and sometimes over 50 ladders crossing crevasses had been shaken up by the earthquake, all these blocks shaken around, ropes ripped out, ladders thrown. Um, and so we realized nobody could get up or down through that route. And we were essentially stranded above the Kumbu Icefall up at camp two with, with a, a few other teams there, but we all had limited supplies of food and fuel, right? Um, so we're all of a sudden wondering, what are we going to do? How are we going to get down? Well, I mean, the whole tale is incredible. And uh, for those who survived, uh, I've seen a lot of video of, of the avalanche blowing through and just, you know, if you can imagine the sheer panic, I mean, I was in a, I was in an earthquake, uh, 
uh, roughly 1990, 1992, something like that in LA when the, when part of the 10 freeway, you know, collapsed and buildings went down and it was so intense. And like you said, you feel like you're like a, like a tiny pebble inside of a, a bucket that, and somebody's taking that bucket and just like shaking it violently and you've got no control. And it's just like, Oh my gosh, what's next? And to survive that and then having to go and rescue different people. And then the one team doctor, uh, that was close to you that helped your team, uh, not making it, uh, you know, it's just, it's just tragic. And it's just part of the game of, of, of mountaineering. But, you know, Gary, I, I like to think because people talk to me about, hey, you know, mountaineering is so so dangerous and why do you do it? And I said, you know, to me, it, it it's it's really not if you prepare in the right way. And the people who um, have, have uh, not found the right kind of fate, you know, in their life and something, you know, awful has happened, it's because of either A, bad luck, or they're just not prepared. And bad luck is just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And once every hundred years, there's a major earthquake, like what happened to you guys. And if you just happen to be there on that date, then it was just your time to go. And unfortunately, that's just the the, the, the reality of, of mother nature. But the other component of that is like the guys in 1996 in the thin air. And those guys, that from the, from the guides that brought them up there to the climbers that were there, I mean, everything went wrong and they could not have been and put themselves in a worse position for, for tra tragedy to strike. And so, you know, the key, as, as I have found, is trying to find guys like you, uh, Phil Irishler, you had mentioned, Vern, Tejas, uh, Mike Hamill, these other guys who've been in the mountains, have the experience and, and really know how to guide and lead these different teams to make sure that people put themselves in the best position. Exactly. Yeah, I, I can't underemphasize how important I think it is to prepare yourself properly for these expeditions. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate that I get to climb year round on mountains all over the world. I think I'm traveling at least 10 months a year um, on mountaineering expeditions. So for me, it's uh, it's fun and, and it keeps me sharp in my game. And, and for folks that, you know, have to hold down a, a nine to five day job, throughout the year and, and, and get the training and to go on an expedition, it's a lot tougher, right? You, sometimes they can only go to the gym or, or do the uh, stairs in their apartment building. Um, but the best thing obviously is to get out into the mountains and to be able to, uh, to train at altitude and carrying loads on uneven terrain and get onto the glaciers um, because that's what we're doing up high on these, these big peaks. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to, to put in the hard work the training so that when you show up for a game time, you're ready to go. Yeah, you know, this is one of the main reasons why I moved to Sun Valley, Idaho. I live across the street from the mountain. I'm in the mountains every day. Uh, and, and the one thing I think that, that you find success in anything that you do, again, take this with business, take this with another sport and mountaineering, but I truly love the process. I love the process of training and I love the process of going up and down the mountain. And I, in, in as much as going to Antarctica was a unique experience and, and climbing uh, Vincent and, and summiting and, and doing all those things, <coughs> excuse me, it was all the, 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 the lead up to, to the preparation of getting up, you know, early in the morning and being out in the cold and the dark and, and putting on my skins and my skis and going to the top and being at 10,000 and coming back down and, and being miserable for a while. And that's, and I think it's those people that, that really embrace that, that take that on, that love that process, succeed in whatever they're doing, because then you form this, this will that you're not going to give up no matter what. Exactly. You know, one of my philosophies that resonates with what you just said is um, I believe what you put into it, you get out of it. So the harder you have to prepare and train and work, um, before, during an expedition to make it safe and successful, the more you get out of it, the more reward there is personally just for you and, and feeling a good satisfaction of a job well done. Um, so, so that really uh, resonates well with me, Mark. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So uh, shifting just a little bit, I want to talk, uh, yeah, I was reading about this and I was like, what? And that is you, you received a sports Emmy and uh, I see you as a mountaineer. You're very good at it. You've started your own gig, you know, awesome. Kudos, high five. But now in, in I think it's 19, uh, 2016 with Sports Illustrated, you were involved in some kind of film in capturing Everest or something where 
uh, ultimately that led to a award. So talk more about that. Sure, sure. So in 2016, uh, we did a film project in conjunction with the Everest expedition I was leading where we brought up some uh, virtual reality cameras, 360 degree cameras. And uh, we captured the route and some stories from our climbers and the summit. Um, and that footage was made into a film called Capturing Everest, which Sports Illustrated um, made. And they partnered with uh, Time Magazine. And um, I was named an executive producer because it was my expedition and I was coordinating everything. Uh, with the cameraman and, and how we were going to shoot and get the camera up to the summit. Um, so I was very surprised uh, that I was a recipient of an Emmy Award when the, when the film won the uh, Award for Digital Innovation uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, but it was a very fun project. And one of the climbers on that trip, Jeffrey Glassbrenner, who was the first American amputee to summit Mount Everest, uh, and he, he and I summited that season together in 2016. Um, he is an incredible guy and uh, kudos to him for all the training and hard work he's done over the years to succeed. He was, uh, he was on the Olympic uh, Paralympic basketball team for a number of years, won gold medal. But anyways, Jeffrey um, made the cover of Sports Illustrated May 2017 for this project. Um, so there's a great photo of him uh, in the Kumbu Ice Fall there. Uh, you can see his prosthetic leg with the, the crampon welded onto it as he's rappelling down through a gnarly section. And uh, that was just a really fun project. Yeah, congratulations to you. And where can people find that, uh, that, that film, that video? I'm not sure if it's on YouTube, Capturing Everest. Yeah, if you just Google uh, Sports Illustrated Capturing Everest, you'll find the link out there on their website or on YouTube. Uh, or you can go to my website, and I've got the link there. Um, underneath the uh, the about the media section on my website, you just click on the uh, the Emmy Capture and Everest. Yep, and that's MadisonMountaineering.com. So I want to talk to you finally about this this last mountain, and I and I purposely wanted to save this for the end. Uh, certainly, Mount Everest is the tallest in the world, and and you and I had uh, shared a cheeseburger or two, <laughs> I think, in Santiago, and and we were starting to talk about this a little bit, but. Uh, that is uh, K2, um, the second highest uh, mountain in the world. I think you access this through Pakistan, and you were telling me a little bit about it and just seems super exotic, super tough. And tell me what your attraction to K2 has been and you know how you see that mountain going forward. Sure. Well, um, I didn't know a whole lot about K2 before – I started researching it and went there for the first time in 2014, but K2 is the second tallest mountain in the world. And Ed Veesters refers to it as the Holy Grail of mountaineering. Um, and it's known amongst the climbing community as the climber's peak um, because it's a lot harder than Everest in general. Uh, the reason it's harder than Everest, one, it's a lot tougher to get to um, just to trek into base camp there. Number two, it's a steep mountain. From the base to the summit, it's just steep all the way. Whereas on Mount Everest, the terrain is more undulating. You have some flat sections, some gradual sections, a few steep bits, but it's more forgiving terrain. Whereas on K2, once you start, it's just steep the whole way to the summit. If you make a mistake and slip and fall, you're probably going to fall all the way down to base camp. Yeah. It also has more severe weather. There's storms that roll in frequently. It's tough to predict the weather. And because it's so steep, there's more debris falling down the mountain, like snow avalanches, ice fall, rock fall. So whereas the death rate on Everest now, I think, is somewhere around uh, 2%, on K2, the death rate for, for summiters is nearly a quarter, almost 25%. Hmm. Um, so that seems like a staggering number when you, when you look at the big picture, the risk uh, on K2 versus Everest and, and other peaks. Um, and so I was attracted to K2 and, and wanted to see what this was all about. Um, you know, I, I like to take on big goals and challenges, as do many climbers. And uh, I did some research and decided to go there for the first time in 2014. Um, and we got really lucky that season. We had good weather, good route conditions. And myself and a few uh, buddies of mine got to the summit in 2014. I went back two more times, 2015, 2016, did not summit. Nobody summited those years. It was just too stormy, avalanches, danger up high. And then we went back last summer, 2018. I got my second 
second summit of K2 and with my team and uh, felt really fortunate to have that experience. So I believe I'm the only climber from the Western Hemisphere, the Americas, to reach the top of K2 twice. So what is it about K2? Is there a route that you've found that you feel like it makes it safer for you to get from the bottom to the top? I mean, take aside that the point that you just made about the steepness, about the weather, about debris falling, those types of things. I mean, that's just going to be there on your best day, uh, regardless if it's uh, you know, stormy or sunny or anything else. But is, is there a certain time of year or a different route or something else that you've done to make in your mind safer to reduce that risk? Yes, absolutely. Um, the way I've strategized in my approach to K2 is to modernize the way we climb the mountain. In the past, um, many climbers would go to K2 um, and, and they, they would go without a lot of support, meaning they had to free climb or free solo various sections of the route, meaning if you fall and you don't stop yourself immediately, you're probably going to fall all the way down. Um, and a lot of climbers in the earlier days weren't using um, the oxygen systems that we have available now, which make us stronger, smarter, more capable climbers at high altitude. Um, we also have more modern weather forecasting systems. And I bring my climbing Sherpa team from Nepal, the team that helps me on Everest. I fly them over from Nepal to Pakistan to come with us and help us on the mountain. And these guys are incredible. Um, they will help set the lines on the route so that when we're clipped into the fixed ropes, if we fall, we're not going anywhere, right? We're, we're staying in place. Yep. Um, they'll, they'll help us set up our hike camps, uh, stock those camps with food, fuel, oxygen, and other supplies. And then they climb with us on summit day. And they love to the summit. These guys are, are, uh, are, are through and through climbers. Climbing's in their blood. They love climbing to the top of the peak and getting down. And, and we do it together as a team. Um, and so I think those, those are the main points that, in my mind, make K2 a manageable peak to bring other climbers to and to lead expeditions on. Yeah, that's incredible. It's incredible. Well, you know, look, I, I've uh, kind of a sports analogy, one game at a time. And when people start projecting like, hey, where do you see yourself in three years in terms of mountains or in my case, back in the day, football games, you know, you have an ultimate goal, but certainly it's just one step at a time climbing up the mountain. And my focus right now is I've turned my attention to Mount Everest for 2020. And uh, you and I, I know we'll have more conversations about that. Um, but, um, uh, you know, K2 on the other side of that in, you know, when the, in the distant future definitely fascinates me and, and uh, love to have that conversation when the time comes. So you are off and running to Mount Everest. Uh, how wired is that mountain? Because we're going to run this pod and I'm hoping that we might even see some live feed from you. Uh, through your site, I think, um, madisonmountaineering.com. Um, how wired is that mountain? Well, you know, this will be my 12th expedition to climb Everest. And I feel like I, I learn something new every year that I can apply to future expeditions, which, which makes it better for our team, uh, safer and more efficient, more enjoyable. But um, Mountains, as we know, are inherently dangerous, and the, the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest, um, always is going to be a dangerous place. It's always going to be risky um, because there's just a lot of snow and ice and rock up there that could potentially fall down in the form of an avalanche. You're up on some big, steep slopes. If you somehow are unclipped or you slip and fall, like you're gone. Um, there's the high altitude risk. You know, you're in the death zone for a number of days or, or at least 24 hours up there on, on summit. Um, and the complications of, of the high winds, the extreme cold, there's uh, crevasses in the Kumbu ice fall you sure don't want to fall into. So it's a risky place. Um, you know, and anyone that says, oh, we have it wired or it's a yellow brick road, you know, that that is uh, the wrong mindset, the wrong mentality. And like you said, one mountain at a time, that's my philosophy. I like to approach it one day at a time moment by moment, reassessing the risk minute by minute in terms of the mountain conditions, the weather, climber health, how our team's doing, um, and, and we adapt day by day. So I feel like, you know, it's, it's a fun mountain to climb. It's hard. It's never easy. Um, but I, I love it because after a successful expedition, 
and getting down safe and, and just seeing how that has a huge, tremendous positive impact on all of the climbers that have been preparing for, for months or years for this expedition. And uh, if, I'm, if I'm lucky enough to feel like I've helped them in their journey to experience this incredible goal of reaching the summit, um, that, that's really the reward for me in the end. I know that uh, certainly the audience will want to uh, follow your journey with your team going up and down the mountain. Um, can they do that on your website, madisonmountaineering.com? Yeah, yeah, just uh, madisonmountaineering.com slash dispatches. There's a, a red dispatches tab there on the top menu bar, and that's where all of our uh, Everest feed will be. We do daily postings, uh, content, what's happening each day. Um, it's very informative. There's photos, videos, and of course, we're also on social media. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting way to, to follow the season for sure. Yeah, well, listen, uh, I will be watching. I will be uh, looking at those dispatches every day as of probably in this next week or so when you land there and you get going and, and start your trek up to base camp. And so best of luck to you, best of luck to your, your team, and look forward to seeing and talking with you on the other side. Hey, awesome, Mark. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure talking with you and, and uh, bouncing around on these different topics of goal setting, achievements, uh, suffering, putting in the hard work to, to see what we can get out of it. Have a great spring, and I look forward to connecting with you this summer. All right, buddy. Take care.